Yeah, there were a, a number of things we had to overcome. Um, and some of them actually, uh, Gina, became, began before flight. So uh, we had uh, warm um, methane uh, on our first day of flight, and we had to uh, work with SpaceX to adjust that and get ready to go for the second day. And so we overcame that. Um, I think we published the uh, Star Tracker issue, which was we had too tight of a tolerance check on a, on a numerical condition for the measurements coming out of the Star Tracker. That prevented our vehicle from staging all the way to uh, a sun pointing power positive. So we had to patch the, uh, the uh, interface with the Star Tracker to fix that. Um, if we don't fix that, the mission ends very quickly, but the team was very effective on that. Another one that probably ticks off a few of those, we, we discovered in our commissioning maneuver um, that we had uh, a drift in the yaw channel of our main engine control. So if you'll hand me micro OD. During a main engine burn, uh, the way we steer the vehicles, we actually gimbal uh, the motor. And so you, you turn it one way and it, it helps provide uh, control on these two axes. We were drifting to one side during the commissioning maneuver. And then we saw it again in TCM1. So what we had to do to troubleshoot that was to come up with scenarios where our engine geometry understanding and control would, would lead us into that drift. We knew we could do the small burns, but it was not going to be sufficient for the longer burns of LOI and power descent. So we did a couple of troubleshooting steps there. One was we moved the, the CG estimate on the vehicle around, which we suspected wasn't really the case, but it, it mimicked the signature we were seeing. And then we did a patch to our engine geometry, which was what we call an I-load set, or parameters that the software reads kind of from a flat file. We updated our I-loads to redefine the engine geometry because we began to understand that under full thrust load, uh, the geometry of our actuators was slightly different. And so we're able to patch that, and that led us to the successful LOI and the successful power descent. I will tell you that um, on the day of landing, when we watched the pointing control come across the consoles, it really looked like a video game. It was so good. I had never in any of our simulations seen the engine perform as well as it was after we had tuned it up uh, through those burns. But if we hadn't done that, then uh, we would not have been able to land on the moon. So those were some big steps for us. Uh, we published a few things about learning how to chill our engine in. We do have a cryogenic engine. We have to chill the metal of the engine itself uh, before we can fire the engine. Our first commissioning maneuver, we didn't get it right on the methane side, and we had to try again, and we fired uh, successfully, but not on time for the, the commissioning maneuver. We came back and reloaded for our first correction maneuver, TCM1, and uh, we missed the, the other side, the oxygen side. I may have them backwards. We met, missed oxygen on the first one, we missed methane on the second one. And we had to reload, and a couple hours later, we came back and we dialed that in. From that burn on, though, we had it perfected. And the next five burns, the process that we tuned once we were in orbit, we hit all five burns exactly on time of ignition. If I get to the moon and I miss LOI by even a minute, we don't land on the moon. It's, it's very, very precise. So that was another one we overcame. We did end up in a lower orbit uh, after LOI than we'd anticipated. Our paraloon was low. Um, and fortunately, our flight dynamics engineers had preloaded the ability to do a lunar correction maneuver, and we were able to push that up and move our orbit from our planned lunar orbit, which would be 100 kilometers circular, basically into something very close to our descent orbit. So effectively, we had the agility in our control room to move deorbit insertion from orbit 12 to orbit 3, something like that. Uh, what else do I have on my list? Oh, we discovered that the laser rangefinders weren't working. <laughs> um, again, it was an interface issue, and, and we've talked a little bit about that. You know, there's a pin in the cable that's a safety feature that once you, you put it on, you can't see if that pin's in place or not. And it's a Type 4 laser, so we didn't test it once we got to the Cape. Clearly something we can fix and rectify uh, in testing on the next time through. And nonetheless, the, um, the vehicle performed just with our optical navigation system above expectations and allowed us to land safely. And then there were a number, a number of other things that probably don't rise to the same level. And, and a lot of these things were um, crises anticipated, identified, 
and resolve before they impacted the mission. And so the team was excellent in saying, okay, if this is the challenge we're faced with, this is the resolution, and how do we marshal our resources in that control room and with our backup uh, team four to make sure they did not impact our ability to land safety, safely. Thank you so much. We have another question in the room that we're gonna take. Uh, hi, Eric Berger with uh, Ars Technica. Uh, first question is for Steve or Tim. Can you describe how the lander came to be gently landing on the moon? I guess it's only about 30% tipped over. Do you think it's leaning against a rock um, or something's holding it up? Um, and then Joel, I'm interested in, in sort of your assessment of the mission in terms of the objectives NASA hoped to see from the soft landing to getting all the data back. Um, was this like 100% mission success from the Eclipse program's perspective, or how would you sort of grade it? So with respect to um, piecing together what happened at landing, we received telemetry. If you remember, on, on the evening of landing, we had no communication signal and then a weak signal. And in our consoles, the data was up to a point and then frozen until that communication was, was restored. So we had an indication that we had landed um, and we were upright uh, with that stale data. And when we came back and looked at it, um, when we restored the communications, we noticed that we were getting the IMU telling us we have see gravity more in the Z direction than in the X direction. Well then, we did a reconstruction where we actually calculated based the, the trajectory and the flight dynamics guys calculated that we actually came down just short of our landing site at a higher elevation than where our landing site was going to be. About a 1.5 kilometer difference between the ellipse uh, of, of uncertainty for our landing and where we touched down. That elevation was higher, so we came in with more downward velocity and we came more with ho more horizontal velocity. And so we hit harder um, and sort of skidded along the way. And we see that disruption in the regolith from the LRO data that we've been able to get from uh, LRO and, and ASU. And that um, discoloration says that we came down with the engine firing because the automated flight manager had not moded to where it was trying to sense and shut down the engine. We saw a spike when we touched down in the engine combustion chamber that was like if you shut off the, the, the full thrust with, by landing on the surface. So we know the engine belt contacted the surface. We, the landing gear took the bulk of the load and we broke uh, one or two possibly landing gear. Um, and so we sat there upright with the engine firing for a period of time. And then as it wound down, the vehicle just gently tipped over. And in our simulation with 1.6 gravity, we showed that it took about two seconds. And we landed on a 12 degree slope. And then that 12 degree slope compounded with the helium tank underneath or a radio shelf would put us at an angle that's approximately 30 degrees off the surface. And we have that photo now to confirm that's the orientation. We also know the roll orientation when we were gonna set the high gain antenna towards Earth and the solar arrays for the sun. We know that roll worked, but we know when we landed, the top deck solar array was shadowed and we weren't generating power with the top deck solar array, so we got that orientation right. So those were all the parameters that had to unfold over time to get us a good understanding of, of where we came. And then just today, we have this picture of us leaning gently on the surface. If we can pull the picture up, oh great, you read my mind. Um, the LRO image, if you look at it, there's a large crater not far from where we landed. If you look in the middle of the picture, you see there's kind of a dark band. That is that crater. And so the beginning of that dark band is, is the shadow into that, uh, what Mark Robinson from ASU tells me is probably a two billion year old crater. And the first edge of that darkness is about 500 meters from where we are. And then the ridge beyond that is another 500 meters, so about a kilometer away. And then you can see kind of a light band just underneath the helium tank, which is the lunar surface on the far side of that crater. So that'll give you an idea when you look at the picture of how we're oriented. In this picture, the sun is to the right and is moving across the sky right to left. And so it's illuminating the solar array on the other side. And you can kind of get a feel for that 30 degree, let me see if I can get this right. So the camera is, is kind of here and it's taking a picture down between the legs. So we're about at 30 degrees on a 12 degree slope landing like that. And that's how we get to 30 degrees. Earth is off in 
this direction, and so our antennas are in an off-nominal configuration. The reason some of this data took a while for us to get to is we had to really work with um, our, our in-network uh, lunar uh, telemetry um, partners, and then also with DSN to figure out what this strange environment was. Absolutely, our signals were bouncing off the moon. So we were receiving both the direct path signals from our radio and the opposite polarization as well. And so we had to sort through exactly how to do that. But once we got it down, we got into a rhythm where we could monitor um, health and send some basic commands for about 16 hours a day. And then we'd come over uh, Australia and we were able to really pull down data for about eight hours at a time. And that was intense. That's where we had everybody in there. We had no dead air, just like in the radio business. There was no dead air, right? We wanted data coming down all the time. Well, I want to fix this payload. I want to work with scalps. Great. Be downloading data while you're working with scalps. And, and so that was kind of the operation we had. I know that wasn't your question, but I just want to talk about it. So, sorry. I can answer your question you had about um, how we feel about mission success. We don't have a quantitative number to give. As I said earlier, from Eclipse's point of view of demonstrating the model, our, our goal for the first set of task orders called Task Order 2, the big goal was to land your equipment softly so you could get data from it after you land, and that was done successfully. We also identified um, objectives that we had for each of the science instruments, and we're assessing based on the data collected to date and how that was influenced by the landing attitude, how we did. For example, um, Susan Letterer mentioned that we planned to take images from scalps on the way down to look at the interaction of the rocket plume with the surface. We know that we didn't do that. But we're fortunate in that several of these instruments, like scalps and red rolls, will fly on future clips deliveries also. So we have an opportunity in the future to take that data on different vehicles.